Hey, good afternoon. My name is uh, Barton Morris. This is Travis Copenhager, and we are a cannabis legal group, or at least two of the lawyers that comprise of such. And uh, we are doing another show. I don't know which. This is uh, episode 69, which is uh, awesome. And we are uh, super excited. Uh, I think, like, this this show, the last one, maybe a few in the future, are going to be talking about Proposal 1, the initiative to regulate marijuana like alcohol, the the, the, uh, the initiative that's going to legalize adult use marijuana in Michigan. We're going to talk about today uh, the potential for social use. Uh, we have a very uh, special guest. Her name is Courtney Barnes. She's a lawyer with uh, Vicente Cedarberg, our partner law firm in uh, Colorado. She's done a lot of work on this issue, uh, um, so I might as well uh, bring her on right now. Like, I suppose we can um, uh, announce that we did have a very successful seminar a couple weeks ago at Cobo Hall. There's another one coming up uh, this this next week. The Cannabis Aid Conference will be there as well. Um, it it's, looks like it's going to be very well attended. Uh, there's going to be um, a lot of people coming in from out of town uh, that that I've been advised of. So uh, it's definitely an event that I think the, the whole industry should be at. You know, the organizers seem to be really cool. There's going to be a mixer on uh, that Friday night at the uh, Port Authority. Uh, not sorry, Friday. It's going to be. Tuesday, Tuesday. Night, yeah, Tuesday night at the at the Port Authority. Uh, it's it's going to be a good good event. So we're going to be there, and uh, anybody that seeks, it's going to be there that hasn't met us yet. We appreciate coming by and saying hello. Um, also, feel free to hopefully make some comments uh, and some questions regarding social use. Social use, if you don't already understand, is the ability for those that are uh, using cannabis in a place where they're allowed to do so, where it's not illegal. Because as you may know and may understand that at the present time, it's illegal to use uh, marijuana, even if you're a medical marijuana patient, uh, in a place other than, uh, or I should say, it's illegal to use it in any place that's not private. It's got to be in your home, and obviously that is not the best place to do it sometimes. And so uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to add Courtney here. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Barton. Gonna... How are you all doing? It's not well, right? We are. We are great. Uh, let's see. We, why don't we begin by telling us uh, a little bit about yourself? My name is Courtney Barnes. I work in Vicente Cedarburg LLC's Denver office. We're a cannabis-focused law firm that um, pretty much is full-service transactional work in um, either the hemp, or cannabinoids, or marijuana space. I work in the hemp and cannabinoids practice group, and I also assisted with drafting Denver's social use ordinance, Initiative 300, which was passed in November of 2016. Congratulations. So let me let me get that straight. Uh, initiative, uh, you said 300? Yes. And you drafted that for the legislature to pass? That is a local ordinance. Oh. So it was at the Denver level. Colorado currently doesn't have a... Um, state structure for permitting social use it's not prohibited and there's been a lot of efforts to allow it in various forms most recently there was a uh, tasting room bill that actually passed but was vetoed by the governor this past session so there will probably be something at the state level coming next year but right now it's um there's kind of a patchwork of local ordinances okay cool well then um that's that's awesome. You're definitely uh, highly qualified and uh, clearly, uh, you know, expert in the in the field, having drafted the law that currently based and it could be the only one that exists in the country, as far as as I know. But if there if it's not, there's only yeah, very it's few definitely other ones. like the next phase after recreation is kind of my understanding. So obviously the trend, you know, we we start with a pretty tightly controlled medical system, then we you know flesh out that medical system. We move into recreational and adult use laws, and then Kind of beyond that is where we start seeing uh, the ability to consume marijuana in public. Um, one of the things Michigan does uh, in Proposition 1, uh, Proposition 1 is a very dense set of initiative language. It, it designs individual rights, it decriminalizes marijuana, creates a commercial industry that mirrors our medical industry right now. Uh, but there is a big part of this bill that provides flexibility for our laws to effectively uh, create new types of marijuana licenses. And we really don't have a limitation under Proposition 1, if that law passes, uh, on what kinds of marijuana licenses we can have in Michigan. Um, the most obvious and ones that get the most press would be uh, licenses relating to industrial hemp. But there's quite a bit of language in the ballot initiative that contemplates and almost, you know, 
seems to anticipate social use licensing, and that's what we're kind of flesh out today. Which is super exciting. Why don't you like go into that then? Sure. So Proposition 1, if passed, would create what's called the Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, or the RTMA. Um, and effectively, the primary purpose of the RTMA is to legalize marijuana in Michigan at the individual level. That would go into effect in about 10 days after the election is verified as passed. Um, so approximately November 16th or 17th if it passes. Um, and then the next primary thing that law does is it licenses commercial industries. So our grows, our processors, our provisioning centers, or what we'll call marijuana retailers for adult use. Um, and that is really step one and two of the RTMA. Uh, but step three and beyond is the flexibility for LARA, the department that's going to be delegated to do all this, to design new types of marijuana licenses. Um, just to give you the, the sausage behind the way this law works. Um, the LARA has one year to implement a licensing system for the commercial manufacture and distribution of marijuana products, so our grows, our processors, our dispensaries. Um, and then in that time, that is what they have to do in that first year. Um, now after that, you know, approximately one year after they started accepting applications for that first round of licensing, they can start accepting applications for any new types of marijuana licenses they create. So as they're designing, you know, the adult use licenses, um, as they're designing the ones contemplated more directly by the law, um, they're also having the, the creative space to create licenses for things like industrial hemp, delivery, and what we're going to talk about today, which is social consumption. And there's no limitation on what they can do. LARA can create licenses that allow the equivalent of a hookah lounge where you can smoke on site. They can allow uh, spaces where you can consume non-smokable forms of marijuana. They can allow concert venues or fairs or places where consumption can be allowed at a temporary time. Um, the only limitation on any of that is if any type of consumption is allowed, it, it, you can't allow children to be in the area, the same way a bar works or a, uh, you know, other types of controlled substances work. So the law allows 21-year-olds to consume cannabis. So social use licensing, the only real limitation on it by design in this ballot initiative is on you know, only ensuring adults are there. Uh, I want to note and uh, remind everyone that we're talking about an initiative that's going to be on the ballot on uh, November 6th and a couple Tuesdays from now. And this is not going to happen unless, and Mac Wolf actually uh, in a comment just mentioned this, that we have to vote yes on Proposal 1 and we have to get a majority of the votes in order for this to be law. Uh, and, and so that's super important. It's important to mention all the time that we have to get out and vote, that this has to pass, and then everything that we're talking about can and will be uh, in effect, and, and hopefully the social, this, what we're talking about today specifically is social use, uh, will be implemented uh, shortly thereafter. So, uh, Courtney, why don't you tell us about, I guess, your experience in, or in the manner in which that you sought an appropriate to draft uh, Denver's social use ordinance? So, um, similar to the initiative that's being proposed in Michigan, Amendment 64 is our adult use um, marijuana legalization measure. And um, that was passed in 2012, and it set up a licensing structure for businesses to sell, cultivate, and, um, and distribute marijuana to adults age 21 years and older. And in that law, it says that um, nothing in this section shall permit consumption that is conducted openly and publicly. So, or in a manner that endangers others. So that was kind of our structure to um, create the initiative both at the, pardon? Can you repeat that part again? Sure, so Amendment 64 states that nothing in this section shall permit consumption that is conducted openly and publicly or in a manner that endangers others. Okay. Um, so it's the openly and publicly part is kind of what we were seeking to create a structure under but they don't define openly and publicly in state law. So localities have taken different approaches to define openly and publicly, and our approach um, with the Sensei Cedarburg, where I was working when we helped, uh, when we dropped this initiative, is we defined openly as not including a designated consumption area. So that's kind of how we labeled it, and we required that there to be visibility restrictions so you can't see consumption occurring. There's age restrictions that has to be 21 years of age and older. And then there's also um, working under the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act. So at a local level, you can't change those rules. So you kind of have to, what that means is that if you're going to consume inside, 
it has to be vaporizing or edibles, and outdoors would combustion would be allowed. Cool. Do you are you familiar with any uh, like challenges to the ordinance? Has anybody like like tried to I assume that may be the case? Absolutely. So it's it's always scary, and um, it takes some time for jurisdictions to get used to the concept of adult use. And so the big thing was visibility and, you know, children being exposed to cannabis consumption. However, if you think about it, that's exactly what these consumption venues are trying to resolve, which is people smoking outdoors, people smoking in their house or not being able to consume in their home due to leases, you know, uh, private housing, homeowners associations, and having no place to consume, therefore they're consuming in public and, and minors and children are more likely to be exposed to that. So while that was kind of our biggest um, objection was just the visibility of these venues and whether you know, you'd be able to see what happens inside or they would know what's happening inside, but it also um, it provides a solution to a lot of that as well. Right. We also, um, the only other uh, big issue was also alcohol consumption and whether to allow dual consumption, how to regulate that, and it ended up um, being where liquor licenses are not permitted to provide a space for consumption as well. So that is, takes, is kind of, um, eliminates a lot of potential venues that would otherwise be really compatible for this type of thing, but is, you know, it's not an end-all, be-all. We've still been able to create a structure where these businesses operate successfully. Right. So one of the reasons Barton and I really wanted to talk about this topic in, in particular is because one of the things we hear all the time is um, what happens after adult use is implemented. Uh, there, You always hear, you know, arrests are going up, people don't, you know, follow the rules and things. And, and as we were talking about in setup for the show, it's very important that if something like this is allowed, they need a safe and legal place to do it. The same reasons that you mentioned before, you know, if people truly believe it's not appropriate to consume cannabis, you know, around kids and, in, and around people who don't want to be around it, everyone agrees with that. No one would disagree with that. But if there isn't safe and convenient places to actually go engage in this conduct safely, um, then, you know, you're going to run into situations where there isn't an opportunity to, you know, do something the most appropriate way. Um, so, you know, pushing for access for something that's legal in your state is, is very much in the grain of what social consumption licensing is. And social consumption licensing in Michigan, we have the uh, fortunate benefit is if we pass Prop 1, it's very, very flexible. Um, and we're not only flexible in our licensing for something like social consumption, we're flexible in our licensing for any marijuana-related activity you can contemplate. Uh, we're getting a comment, uh, forgive me, I didn't catch your name, we're getting a lot today, about, well, what about, like, us? What about... So, and it doesn't even matter who you are. What about some sector of this industry that you want to be a part of that doesn't necessarily get contemplated by the licensing currently listed? Well, Lara in Michigan has the flexibility to create a license type uh, that might be appropriate for you. And you have an opportunity to directly address Lara as a member of the public for that need. Um, they have to meet, our, our administration basically has to meet four times a year at minimum to um, hear public feedback for how they're implementing not just the adult use licenses that are currently on the books, but any needs of the marijuana industry. And I think social consumption is a big one, if we're lucky enough to pass Prop 1, to, to really implement. And even if you don't like marijuana, you need a place for marijuana to be consumed safely and away from the people who don't want it. Um, so now that Denver's you know, been working very closely on that, what kind of implementation are we seeing under that ordinance? So something to consider when you all implement, um, or in the event that this passes and you can start creating the guidelines for this structure, is um, ensuring that setback requirements and zoning are not too stringent where um, people are not using the venues to consume because it's not convenient. So there's kind of this balance of keeping it away from certain things, for example, schools and typical venues that you would have setbacks from, uh, in the marijuana space, and then also making sure that it's accessible enough to where people aren't having to drive to these industrial areas or, you know, get in the car and travel very far to access these venues. So that was one of the issues we ran into at Denver because we drafted the ordinance to pretty much have setbacks like a thousand feet from schools and um, I think visibility from places where children congregate. 
but we allowed rulemaking, and at the city level, they added substantial additional setback requirements that effectively limited the success of this initiative because they're just really not in high populated areas where people are consuming anyway in public. So I would say that's something to keep in mind is just while it is important to have distance requirements, you also want to make sure that these venues are convenient so that people will use them. Right. You hear pushback, for example, that there's concern over the risk of people smoking and driving. Well, there's a perfect reason why you'd want these to be in a convenient location. If, sure. you, if you take as known that people are going to be smoking, you want to make sure that they're smoking in a safe way. Um, and we can argue about whether they should be. That's a different question. You know, if a, if a law like this passes and it's being implemented, then we want to make sure that that conduct's being done safely. And having a safe place is the whole point. So, you know, when I was looking into the Denver ordinance and, and seeing, like, how it's actually being implemented and it's hard to find a location that's appropriate, you know, the, the, the rule makers who are going to be drafting this at the state level and at local levels need to understand, well, what's the point of even having it? You want a place where the people who smoke, you know, or consume in your community uh, are doing it in an appropriate way in a safe place. So if you put them out on the outskirts of town 20 miles away from, you know, where they all actually are and want to be, uh, then, you know, what are some unintended consequences of that? Because nobody, nobody wants this to not work. Um, nobody wants the, the people with concerns to make those concerns become a reality. Um, so, you know, and this applies not just to social consumption, but all of these licenses. Um, so. All right, we have quite a number of questions. Perhaps we should... Uh, actually, yeah. I did have one more question, if you uh, know, uh, Courtney. How many other ordinances or how many other cities have gone on board, gotten on board in Colorado or, or in other states with social use uh, licenses or any type of ordinance or law governing them? So different municipalities take different approaches, um, you know, ranging from non-enforcement essentially to private clubs and venues. I know that uh, Inglewood had one or at least attempted to that was like a private club kind of setup. There was also one in southern Colorado that's also done something similar in the past, and it, that kind of was sort of a membership-based type structure. Um, but we've also had attempts at the state level that have uh, been successful, for example, the tasting room, whereas it would be um, either attached or located near a retail marijuana establishment and would be licensed kind of under that regime so that sales would be permitted. So that's kind of a different um, consideration is that at the local level, this is a, like a local license separate from what would be at the state, like a state marijuana license. So there's options there, which, you know, either depending on the requirements to get it can restrict entry and participation or also provide a venue where you can provide the cannabis as well as consume the cannabis, which has some safety, you know, benefits as well, too. So... Uh, there's been a bunch of different types of initiatives. Ours has been um, the more recent one, but the membership club has kind of been the traditional approach prior to I-300. And yours is probably the largest city in Colorado, right? To my knowledge, yes. <laughs> so I want to make one distinction, though, between uh, an ordinance, uh, the city ordinance or state law in Michigan, our initiative allows for the department to regulate and license them. Uh, is that going to be subject to a municipal ordinance as well, though? Yeah, and the same way any other state license would be. If Laura licensed them, a municipality can limit the time, place, manner. They can outright prohibit. Basically, they opt in and opt out. Um, but if, if a city wants to allow them, they can allow you know two of them, ten of them. They can zone them. So just like any of our other licensing, all these... Uh, you know, discussions we've had about, you know, a grower license over the past several weeks or an adult use license for a provisioning center, um, you know, any of these things. Uh, local municipalities do have a role to play in all of these licenses, uh, but they are subject to the state, LARA, who is actually the one enforcing, implementing, and policing these licenses. So it's, it's a little different than the relationship's going to be in the MMFLA, our medical licensing, but it's very similar. It's similar to the point where the role of the municipality, there's some nuances and distinctions, but it's effectively the same. You know, if a city doesn't want to allow it, uh, public, cons I'm sorry, doesn't want to allow social consumption, they don't have to. Well, let's talk about the reasons why they would want to, right? right. Because from what I understand, and maybe uh, Courtney, you, you you have seen this in Colorado, and I've seen this and read about it in other states. Uh, after the legalization of marijuana, a lot of people are either don't understand where they could use marijuana, or they don't are they don't have a home in which to do it. They can't do it. Where, they don't want to do it where their children are located. 
uh, it's much like a, you know, a bar, the, the necessity to have a place to be able to use, which if, if, if left without could and does cause problems in the fact that the public begins to complain about the fact that people are outdoors or in their cars smoking marijuana or it allows that the odor allows uh, potentially others to smell it. Uh, and then, of course, that will lead to complaints, which will then, of course, lead to uh, police action. And, uh, and that is, is all we're trying to avoid police action, right? We're trying this entire, what, what part of this initiative is about <laughs> reducing the amount of, of police uh, uh, resources necessary to be able to deal with marijuana offenses. And so, uh, and then, Absolutely. yeah, Courtney? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we encountered a, um, sort of a similar problem where enforcement wasn't consistent, but it typically was in lower income neighborhoods where people aren't, either don't own the property or are in public housing or um, are under leases or they're not permitted to use it. As another example, tourism. They stay in hotels. They're not allowed to consume cannabis there. They then resort to edibles, which are not as, you know, easy to determine the effect or in its, its longer onset. So being able to consume in a space where you can vaporize or use combustion, have trained staff that know how to monitor consumers and, you know, recognize impairment. They can ask, you know, facilitate you a ride home or Right. Um, provide you with like the education you need also when you're consuming that has been kind of stigmatized for for tourists and people that don't really have a base that um, or are new to cannabis so definitely the public consumption is huge have, it promotes normalization it promotes education and really just provides like a, a safe controlled environment to to learn more about it our, our movement is led by a group called the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol, and it's kind of the same uh, theory here. If, we, if we're going to legalize marijuana, it's not a free-for-all, you know, no rules at all. We're going to regulate the use of marijuana, but uh, we're, we're deciding as a state in the, in the state of Michigan if it's appropriate to regulate marijuana in a certain way. That's what problem's all about. Um, nobody, I mean, you may be the strongest of advocates, but a reasonable person does not support a free-for-all of walking down sidewalks, smoking, enjoying, um, being high, driving vehicles. Nobody supports that. And if they do, it's only because they're against every rule that's possible, and that's anarchy. Um, you know, take smoking, for example. I don't smoke. I don't like to be around smoke. Um, I don't want to go to a restaurant and smell smoke. Well, a lot of people agree with you. Um, but if we didn't allow smoking to occur in some places, um, then we're going to have problems. Alcohol. Nobody wants, you know, some cities, I guess, in the country allow it, but nobody wants to have people walking down the sidewalk drinking beers. Nobody wants to have them going to kindergarten, you know, plays, uh, sipping a six pack in the stands. Like, that's not what this is doing. But what, but at the same time, we have bars, we have liquor stores, we have places that people can go if they want to consume alcohol outside their home. If you live in a high rise apartment, there's no place potentially for you to light up a joint and smoke and, and, and fumigate your room. But, you know, if we're not allowing places for people to consume, and we all understand that people are going to consume, we're trying to take something that's a problem and make it not a problem by compromising. Here's a safe place that we all agree it's okay to do this, and here's places that aren't. And we can't be black and white. If we don't allow it to happen anywhere, people are going to do it anyway, and they'll do it in places and ways we don't want them to. If we let them do all it, right. All right. <laughs> I, can't, I get going. So. All right, let's get to some questions. We're running sure. out of time. we got a lot of questions. Brad Forrester, who's a frequent viewer, asked, what's the difference between having uh, the necessity of a uh, place that's licensed for social use than like a private club, like an Elks Club or an Eagles Club? I'm not sure exactly what an Elks Club is. Right. Know? Well, the, the, the problem is, you know, the thing with a, a ballot initiative means this law hasn't been implemented. There's a lot of interpretation we're going to just have to be making educated guesses on. So and under our law, it says you can't consume marijuana in public. That's what the ballot initiative will say. Now, just like you've done in Denver, you know, the way they define and, and implement what public does and doesn't mean is going to create opportunities. So a public... Um, the definition of public may or may not entail a private club like an Elks Club. Let me um, just ask, is a private club a club where the public is not permitted to enter? Because that's the law, the case law that's been established thus far. So if, if, if even in your vehicle, let's say a vehicle, the like public's not permitted to enter, but 
uh, the public can approach your vehicle, and the public is is permitted to be in in certain places that your your vehicle is in, like it's, as long as it's not in your driveway. But if it's in a parking lot, let, there's been case law that has demonstrated that a vehicle in a parking lot where other vehicles are permitted to enter is is in public. So, uh, is an Elks Club a private club so the public is not able to enter, or is it? Uh, Not to mention, are, is there a prohibition against anyone under 21 from going in? I mean, it's going to really depend on circumstances, whether it's an Elks Club or some other contemplated um, type of group activity. You know, we can all say, well, my my residence, my private residence is private. But if we go into like a uh, you know, like an apartment complex and we're in a common area, well, that's probably not, even if the only people who can go in there are the people that live in that apartment. So, you know, there's going to be some, um, some areas of the law that we're going to have to kind of wait and see. Um, as this kind of gets rolled out, what, what I'd counsel everyone to do is be cautious. You know, it will be very exciting if problem passes. Everyone's going to be very excited. Uh, but you don't want to be the guinea pig to, the, to you know, in case law to determine if you're in public or not in some of these unique ways. Um, so, you know, as we, as we learn more about how this all rolls out in Michigan, we'll have, you know, better answers in the future. Uh, Stephen and Trish asked about the difference between open consumption of alcohol and the open consumption of, uh, of cannabis. For instance, in a circumstance where, uh, well, first of all, open consumption of alcohol in public is also illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there circumstances when it's legal, let's say like uh, in, a, in a concert venue, right? Or Yeah, and again, I mean, and this probably is, is very similar to Colorado. I mean, if, if the, and alcohol is much more fleshed out in what the rules are and are not. Um, but, you know, if you're in your backyard, um, you know, I, I know this from being in college, there's a difference between being on the sidewalk and being a foot over on the grass. So, you know, one is considered public and one is considered private. Um, now, you know, there are understandings about what you can and can't get away with with alcohol because we've had alcohol my entire life and hundreds of years before that. Um, so I think someone mentioned in the comments, they're, they're scrolling too fast. You know, we do have stigmatization. We do have people who are not used to the substance, whether you support it or not. So we can't just, you know, have a cascade of implementation here. We would all want that. But we do have to take baby steps and, and make compromises along the way until our society is ready to make those decisions as a whole. Yeah, it, it's easy to compare things to alcohol because that's what we're trying to do. We believe it should be regulated like alcohol, but alcohol has been legal in this country since 1930s. And it ha in that period of time has become really uh, common and the, the manners of use and the, and the places of use have become much more customary. And if hopefully it doesn't take as long for uh, cannabis to enjoy the type of um, freedom of, of use, and, uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're just you know, one step at a time, right? Um, somebody asked about casinos. Stephen, Stephen Anthony asked about casinos, smoking up tobacco. We have three casinos here, uh, Courtney, in Detroit, in the Detroit area. Anyway. There's one down and the then, street, too. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. we have a bunch, of, a bunch of them on the Indian Reservation. So I don't know if uh, they allow smoking in their casinos, but in Detroit... So really, weirdly, they, they allow smoking cigarettes in, in, in the casinos there. And so Stephen, again, is like, well, you can smoke right. there. You know, why not you know, be able to use cannabis there? And, and in that vein, you know, there's going to be some, some – and I'm sure – I actually have a question for you after this, Courtney. But, like, you know, we have some, some things we're going to have to figure out. Like where you can consume alcohol and where you can consume cannabis are probably not going to be the same places early into this. You know, eventually that might be allowed, but, you know, in Denver, for example, are there prohibitions against the on-site consumption for these places of alcohol and cannabis? I'd assume there are. So there is a liquor rule at the state level that prohibits a liquor license establishment from providing a space to consume or allowing consumption. Um, I think, as you say, it, it probably won't happen initially, but it is something to consider as you get more used to it. Just because at the end of the day, poly consumption for marijuana and alcohol is very common. As an adult, you are allowed to consume both. And while you can mitigate some risk and, and kind of on a consumer safety perspective at the outset separate these establishments, you're really not going to stop anyone from going next door to the bar or going, you know, next door to the consumption venue or going home to the bar. So I think one day these will coexist together, kind of your ideal concert venue, you know, people should be able to consume what they'd like. But it is a delicate subject with a lot of um, stakeholders. So I don't, it, right now it is not permitted in Colorado, although that we hope it is permitted Someday, in some form. The rules also, our rules, excuse me, not the rules, the proposal uh, one also 
makes uh, for the ability for the department to license in a temporary fashion, right? Yeah, so in Michigan, for example, you know, Prop 1 contemplates the ability for a temporary consumption area. I always think of that as, you know, a, a part of, a, let's say, a concert venue where consumption is allowed in some way, shape, or form. That's probably very likely to be a different part of that concert venue from where the alcohol sales are going to be. But, you know, you can walk into one, consume what you want, walk out, walk into the other, consume what you want. I mean, not to and, mention... And, oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> no, it, is like, it makes sense from a social perspective. It's like, and the convenience factor as well. You know, are you going to provide games? Are you going to provide entertainment? Is it going to be a black box where, you know, there's a couch? You want to... It's, it's all about kind of removing stigmatization and allowing adults to exist as they normally would in a safe social fashion. So... We kind of considered at one point, you know, wristbands. So you have your alcohol wristband at a bar, and then you have your cannabis if you don't want to drink. That would be something you could consider just to differentiate, you know, the substance use. Um, or there's various, yeah, the special events thing is a good idea, allowing that to happen. But um, but it is from a perspective of as, as destigmatization and, and allowing adults to kind of be adults. <laughs> And, you know, all of us, and we're very active, a lot of our audience is very active in um, support. Not all of them. I'm not trying to pigeonhole you all. And everyone's entitled to their opinion. But as we move forward with Proposition 1 in Michigan, um, you know, it does a lot of good. But a lot of this is going to be delegated to our administration, Laura, the Licensing Regulatory Affairs, uh, to, to design rules about what all this is going to be, what applications are going to look like. Um, all of the licenses, social consumption, any one of those possible license types, uh, there really isn't a lot of language about what they need to be and how they need to be designed in the ballot language. Uh, that's going to be part of our rulemaking process through LARA. Um, and again, LARA can you know change, update, and amend as they go. And one of the benefits of that system is it's not going to take legislative adjustment. You know, If the administration is seeing issues with something, they have the flexibility to implement the change they feel is appropriate. Uh, something that we're running into some bottlenecks on the medical side because of the, the way that statute was designed. So, uh, you know, all of these things are going to be an evolving dynamic situation. And we haven't even mentioned things like industrial hemp, delivery, um, all these other types of licenses that can be designed and implemented in our system. We'll take one more question. Um, Cody Furman, nice to see you. Thanks for watching. And uh, William Quad said, uh, if the proposal passes, when will these social use uh, uh, licenses become available and how fast can somebody try to apply for one? Sure. So I'll give you the timeline again. So um, we vote on the 6th. As soon as the election results are official, the law itself is implemented 10 days later. So as soon as possible would be on the 16th. That's November 16th, 2018. From that date, uh, Lara has one year to design a licensing program and start accepting applications. Um, so whenever that is, let's assume it takes them the whole year. That is now November 2019. Um, one year after that date, whenever that is, is how long we have to wait before Laura can start accepting applications uh, for social consumption, industrial hemp, any of the license types that aren't laid out uh, already in the ballot initiative. So effectively two years from now. Okay. Um, Courtney, any last thoughts? Get out and vote. Yeah, yeah vote on the 6th. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on with us today. Uh, you, you were like, you guys are all been awesome, and we're going to come out and see you guys in January at a, a social use type place, the International Church of Cannabis. Uh, and yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, and just wish us luck, uh, and um, we appreciate your availability. Yeah. Thanks. So Anytime. Much. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye. So you, you might notice T Travis has got a name tag on, and uh, we are. Okay. What's that? I'll grab that bag. You grab the bag. There you go. Oh, so yeah. we we are in Traverse City today. Uh, we are at the Marijuana Law Sections uh, State, Bar, State Michigan. Bar Michigan Conference in Traverse City. Um, it's a two and a half day event. We're about to get kicked out of the room we borrowed uh, here in just a few Ooh. minutes, actually. Um, so most of the marijuana attorneys in Michigan, or at least the ones that can join us, are here today. Uh, we're doing continuing education, mostly focusing on the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, but there's a lot of buzz around. Obviously, November 6th is right around the corner. So. Right, which is a great opportunity to discuss cannabis. And there's a bunch of lawyers here, so we're all like getting together and doing everything we can to promote and to uh, support the industry. I'm going to be giving a presentation in about an hour from now, right. <laughs> uh, and 
And it's this cool place to be, too, and hit up here in Traverse City. Yeah, and you were in a town hall yesterday, right, uh, promoting the vote? Yeah, WXYZ. Uh, it's still online. If you go to their Facebook page, uh, myself and Josh Holvey from the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol, we did a debate with uh, Scott Greenlee from Healthy and Productive uh, Michigan with respect to Proposal 1. It was lively. It was really, really fun. Uh, I think that... Uh, if anything, I've learned, I think that a lot of people are probably made up their mind in this issue. <clears throat> it's not It's not like we're going to change a lot of people's minds. A lot of people are just basically, they're completely for it, they're completely against it. I firmly believe that there's a lot more people that are completely for it, which means that it's necessary for people to vote. Because if they're not going to vote, then, then that's going to be the, the, the thing. If anything is going to beat us, that's what it's going to be, right? Yeah. So... Uh, so please, like, share this episode, you know, to help people vote, you know, to help encourage the vote. Share this episode. That's one thing you can do. Share all. Share that uh, town hall meeting. You know, yeah, we'll I mean, be sure was, to. We'll put the link uh, in the comments below here, so you can see it if you're looking. Social for it. media is a great way to communicate and to right. and to and to get a message across. That's why we do these shows. That's why we're engaged on social media. Uh, Jamie, thank you very much. She does a great job. Jamie Cooper does a great job. And, and I mean, great job. Seriously, Definitely. she's like, I mean, she's she's a leader in this industry just as much as we are. And we uh, appreciate everybody's assistance. But this is, this is a critical time. We got like 12 days or 11 days or something. And so uh, we have to we have to vote. We have to vote yes on Proposition 1. Uh, anything else? I think we're good. So we're going to enjoy the rest of our conference here in Traverse City. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, we'll probably do another uh, topic on uh, the Proposal 1 and what it's going to be doing. So if anyone has questions about... Uh, some element of Prop 1, throw them in the comments. We'll pick one out, and we'll do a show on that next week. Yeah, yeah. Please uh, please let us know what, you, uh, what your questions are, and, and we'll do our best to get them answered, all right? So thank you guys very much. Thank you.